now, right here in Acts chapter number 20, I want to draw your attention beginning in verse number 17. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 17. The Bible says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Verse number 23. Say that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saving, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. So I want to point out here quickly, notice that this is going to be the last time that Paul speaks to them. He's pointing out the fact that he's been a, an example unto them, and to use him as an example, these are men that are in the ministry. These are the elders of the church, the rulers of the church. We compare scripture to scripture, we can see that they are the bishops of the church. So he's giving this last bit of advice to them, before he leaves, and he talks about how he was in the ministry, saying this is the same way you should be in the ministry. This is going to be the last time that he sees them. Furthermore, you can prove that by verse number 38. Skip down. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. So that's important. These are going to be the last words that he leaves these rulers with. He leaves the, the elders of the church, the rulers or bishops of the church with. And I want you to look now with that in mind. Verse number 26, wherefore I take you. So he says, wherefore, because I'm leaving, because I'm not going to see you anymore, this is his last words. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost, Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So notice there the reference to a shepherd and the reference to sheep. Keep with that in mind, look at verse number 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. The title of the sermon this evening is Wolves Shall Enter In. Wolves Shall Enter In. I want you to look with me again at verse number 29. I want you to notice the wording here. He says this, For I know this, that after my departing, then he says this, Shall grievous wolves enter in among you. That's imperative. He's saying this is not questionable. He's saying that this is not something that is debatable. It's not up in the air like, hey, maybe you guys might be all right. And then, you know, but these other churches need to watch out. He says, after my departing, and he's an apostle, obviously, some of, someone of higher authority than them, once he's out of the way, after he leaves, it says, grievous wolves shall enter in. So is there a question on whether or not grievous wolves will enter in? That's going to be my first point. Without a doubt. Now, churches nowadays are super naive. Churches nowadays are extremely naive where they think that, hey, everything's just going to be peace and flowers and unicorns and rainbows constantly at our church. I can't wait to start a church and we're just going to thrive in perfect unity and no one's ever going to try to bother us. That is false. Grievous wolves shall enter in. Real congregations, real New Testament churches... There's a pastor there, there's believers there, saved believers preaching the gospel. You know what I can guarantee you from the word of God that will happen eventually? 
Grievous wolves shall enter in. Let that set in. Grievous wolves shall enter in. Also, I want to point out the fact that it says that they are grievous. Another thing that I want to mention here at the very beginning. What does grievous mean? It means like bad or it means severe, right? It means something like terrible or awful. That's what that means, grievous. It, it's related to the word that carries the connotation of hurt. When someone is hurting, they are in great what? Grief. They are grieving, right? So do you know why it's saying grievous wolves? It's saying harmful wolves. Wolves that will come in and that will hurt people. That's what it's saying. Wolves that will come in and that will cause pain. That's what you're saying when you're saying, man, he's in a lot of grief. What are you saying? You're saying that guy's in a lot of pain. So basically what Paul is warning is that there are going to be wolves, which are false prophets or false teachers, right, that are going to come in and these people are going to cause pain or they are going to cause harm in the church. This is not a question. This is a fact. A local New Testament church will eventually have grievous wolves, people coming in to hurt people. Their whole goal is to come in to cause harm and to hurt people. Not only that, I also I want to go through a couple of reasons why it's called a wolf, right? Because it says, it says their grievous wolves shall enter in. So we have, you know, they're referred to as wolves, right? And why is it called a wolf? The reason is because... A wolf is a vicious animal, right? It is a vicious animal. I want you to go over to, keep your hand here, go over to Genesis chapter number 49. Genesis chapter number 49. The Bible often talks about a wolf being uh, ravenous or ravening, right? Or raving, the Bible will say, use those three words. I want you to look at Genesis chapter number 49, verse number 27. We're going to try to get an idea of what it means when it refers to a wolf as being ravenous or raving or raven. This word is used repeatedly. <clears throat> it's, it's along the lines of being ferocious. It's being aggressive. When you picture a raving wolf, what do you picture when you look at that animal? It, it, another thing along the lines of being aggressive and ferocious, they're hungry, aren't they? Normally they have, what do they have? They have like slobber. Just like running out of their mouth. Why? Because they're looking at their prey and they're doing what? They're lusting or desiring after their prey very badly. They're looking at something and they're saying, I want that. Right? That's ravening. That is the definition of a ravening wolf. It's an aggressive animal that's going after prey and it is ferocious. It is violent. That's why it's referred to as a ravening wolf. This is what wolves are, de are defined as or, or spoken of as. Look at Genesis chapter 49, verse number 27. It says this. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. It's like ravening. These are different variations of the same word. Notice this, though. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. Then it says this. In the morning he shall devour the prey. So notice what it's talking about when it says raven. What does it mean? It's talking about it devouring something. It's something that is looking for something to devour. What does it mean to devour? It means to destroy, to tear apart. Maybe it means grievous, to cause harm or to cause pain. That's what it means to devour. There are people that are looking for churches that are false prophets, there are false, false teachers, they are looking for churches to infiltrate and they are ravening wolves. They are looking for churches to come in so that they can devour the church. So they can cause damage or cause harm and hurt people. This is what the Bible teaches. Go back again to Acts chapter number 20. Why also are they called wolves? What's the other reason why? Because wolves feed on the weak. Wolves feed on the weak. Now, of course, spiritually, the pastor's not the weakest person in the church. So you know who they go after is they go after the sheep. And not only do they go after the sheep, but they try to go after the weakest of the sheep. They will try to go after the weakest of the sheep. And this is what wolves do. Wolves, they go after prey that is very simple. Now, the, uh, it's easy to go after. Now, the reason why you, you hear the talk of wolves and sheep is because it is, it is common in nature for wolves to go after sheep. Do you know why? Wolves are not very good at, or I'm sorry, sheep are not very good at fighting back. Sheep don't have the greatest self-defense mechanism that are built in. They're, 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 very, they're very harmless animals, right? They're extremely hard. They, you know, they don't have a lot of uh, ways to protect 
themselves. So when a wolf comes in there, it's just dinner, basically. It's lunch, right? So what they're, and the reason why wolves attack sheep very often is because they are vulnerable, because they are weaker animals, because they are able. Now notice when the grievous wolves are going to enter in. When did he say? After I depart. You notice that? After I depart, grievous wolves shall enter in. He says, grievous wolves shall enter in. And notice who they're going to go after. Did he say, hey, watch out, the wolves are going to try to get you guys. Notice he said who? He said, the flock. They're going to go after the sheep. Right? They're going to go after those that are in the church, those that are in the congregation. So you need to try to watch out for them. This was the advice that was left to a pastor, to a bishop, right before he left, to the overseers of the church. Now, don't you think this is pretty important? He says, it shall happen. So this is something that a ruler or a pastor needs to take heed to. But not only that, this is something that the congregation needs to be aware of. The congregation needs to be aware of. Look there in Acts chapter 20. It also says this. So again, read verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Then notice what it says next. Not sparing the, the flock. Notice that. This is just an unsatiable type of person, isn't it? It's an implacable type of person. It's a person that they, they're not going to spare the flock. So what does that mean? That means it's a type of person that's not going to show mercy. They're a very cold-hearted, wicked, evil person. Now, the reason why churches are so naive about this today is because they have been fed and they have swallowed the philosophy of our modern-day culture today, which is Western philosophy that everybody's good at heart, which is a bunch of stinking baloney. Right. That is not true. People are sinful. Right. And what happens is, among sinful people, there are utterly wicked people. People that are just utterly wicked to their soul where they enjoy hurting people. Where they look for opportunities to hurt people. This is just a fact. Pedophiles exist. Right. They exist. There are pedophiles in the world. So if there's someone out there that desires to do that to a child, where do you think they're going to go? Maybe where children are located. That's why you, you, when they catch pedophiles all the time, where are they? Schools, churches, places like that. Evil people exist. So we don't need to live in some sort of fairy tale land and pretend like everything's great and everything's wonderful. Grievous wolves shall enter in. You know what they go after? They go after the weakest people. Oftentimes they go after children, don't they? Oftentimes you see, you see all different types of offenses that take place in churches. And a lot of the time, who does it happen upon? Children. Look at verse number 30 now. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Notice what they're speaking. He says perverse things. Among people that would maybe preach for a little while and they're up on the pulpit and you think this guy's good, you think this guy's normal, and then all of a sudden something horrible happens. Something terrible happens. And then this was maybe a person that you trusted, maybe a person that you thought was a great person. That's why he says among your own selves. False prophets will arise. Look at verse number 31. He says this. Therefore, watch. That's important advice, man. Therefore, watch. Why? Because there are wolves, grievous wolves. What does that mean? People that are want to come in and they want to cause pain. They want to harm people. They want to harm children. They want to come in, they want to split up marriages. They want to come in, and they want to cause issues within the church. They want to hurt children. There are people out there that want and desire to do these things. You, you as, a, as, a, as what would be more of a, of a good Christian or more of a righteous person, right? You know, obviously there's none righteous, but living a just, godly life in the, in the terms of the Bible, right? You, by fitting into that category, it may be hard for you to understand that people like this is, exist. But there are people that sit around and devise and try to conjure plans of, I'm going to go into that church. I'm going to go visit that church. And then they come in and they see everyone. And they are plotting. And they are looking for an opportunity to hurt and harm people. It's not always children. But one thing I have to keep in mind is that they are looking for the vulnerable. So this is advice also in the introduction of this sermon. Because I'm going to go through a lot of the characteristics of a false prophet or a false teacher. We're going to go through these and we're going to look at them and try to identify them. But my job is to watch after. And if I, if I sense something, you know, I'm going to jump on it. And it's going to be confronted head on. 
You know, if I think somebody comes into the church and I even feel like for a minute like this person could be, could be causing a problem, I'm going to take that person aside and I'm going to speak with that person. But this also needs to be addressed as well. You need to make sure that you're not a vulnerable Christian. This is a reason why you need to know your Bible. Men and women. A lot of times people are like, well, that's for the man. No. Why can't a woman know her Bible just as well as her husband? What's the problem with that? Why can't the woman have just as much or more scripture memorized than her husband? Right? Men are not intellectually superior to women. Men and women are just as smart as one another. You have just as much capability as your husband does. You know, oftentimes in the family, the man is the most, the most spiritual because he strives to be, of course. But why can't the woman strive to be as spiritual as she can be as well? And, and, and not put herself in a position where she's vulnerable. The reason why a man would strive to be is because he wants to be the leader. He should do that. He should try to stay ahead so that he's the one leading the family. But the, the wife shouldn't just stand aside and be complacent with mild or moderate Christianity. You can be putting yourself at risk to be manipulated by some wolf. You can be putting yourself at risk you know, to be manipulated by a very wicked, evil person that would come in and that would seek to do harm. Maybe in your marriage, maybe in just the church in general, maybe to harm children. So you guys need to be able to keep an eye out as well for this. This is not just my job. This is, this is my responsibility, but there's obviously a personal responsibility unto each family, unto themselves, and to the husbands for their family as well. And then, of course, you care about your brethren. So you could be a, a watchman unto your brethren. If you see something, obviously, that needs to be brought to my attention. We want to build the church, but we don't want to build it at the expense of harming the good Christians that we already have here. So we need to keep our eyes out. Now, this also, this is the other part of the, the last point of the introduction. This also does not equal that we, like, interrogate every person as a wolf when they come visit our church. Charity believeth all things. There are red flags, and we're going to look at these tonight. And if you see these things start to come up, then yes, hey, you can, you can, and you think like, hey, there's, they're meeting these characteristics, or hey, something very bad happened. This needs to be brought to my attention immediately. You know, that may sound odd to you that, that we actually practice the Bible too, but this is real Christianity. This is real church. Amen. And if something actually happens, we throw people out of here. If they're trying to harm and hurt somebody, I will pick them up and throw them out of this church. Amen. I'm not kidding even slightly. Not even a tiny bit. We, we really seriously practice Christianity here. And we care about the people in our church. Amen. Amen. There are a lot of churches out there that don't practice these types of biblical methods. And there's pastors that are not taking the responsibility of the watchman, of the overseer, and looking after the sheep. And they're going to have to answer for that one day. They're going to stand before God, and maybe people were harmed in their church. And you know whose fault it was? Theirs. Because they were not watching out well enough. And sermons like this need to be preached so that the people are warned as well. Amen. <clears throat> I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 15. Another thing about wolves is that they are elusive. They are elusive. What does that mean? That means that they are crafty and they are cunning creatures, right? They're very sneaky. They stalk their prey. They stalk their prey. What does that mean? It means like they're doing recon. A lot of military guys in here, right? They're doing recon. They go and they kind of look things out. They stalk from afar. They, you know, they stand back and they, they plot what they're going to do or they make devices of what they're going to do and they conjure up a real plan. I, I, um, I listened to someone that, that actually studied predators, and, and she wrote a book on it, and I listened to an interview that she did, and she went in and, and interviewed just tons of, of people that were busted as some sort of predator, whether it was, you know, uh, you know a, a pedophile, a rapist, you know, a homosexual, whatever it was. Those are pretty much all one and the same, by the way. Amen. But she went in and she interviewed these people when they were incarcerated, when they were in prison, and she, and she asked them a line of questions to try to get into their head. And when she was asking the questions, uh, she, was, she was trying to figure out whether it was, it was, it was something that was pre-planned. And she said 100% of the time. This is some liberal psychologist. She said 100% of the time that they said that I sat back and I watched and I waited. I wish I could cite the reference for you. 
But she says that she said that 100 percent of the time they answered and said that that they watched, they waited, and they had a very elaborate plan to do this. That means that they're prepared. You know what that means about you? You need to be prepared. That's right. These people are are listen to me. There's that's a real battle where they are stepping back and they're like drawing up. You know, they're like drawing up a strategy, like a military strategy, on how they are going to hurt you and harm you. These are real people that already harmed people. And they're saying, this is how I did it, and this is the way that it happened. And I thought about this, I wanted to do it, and then I stepped back and I put a plan together so that I could harm your family, so that I could harm your children, so that I could harm you and other people in this area. Doesn't that make you, doesn't that, doesn't that, that cause you to, to have the, even more of a sense of why you should be prepared? Watch, he said. Look at Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 15. It says this, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So notice they come in sheep's clothing, right? What are they being? They're being elusive. Wolves are already elusive. Like a lion, a wolf and a lion, almost repeatedly in the Bible, they're used interchangeably, over and over and over again, like we already saw. They're used interchangeably all the time, talking about the roaring lion and the ravening wolf, repeatedly, over and over again. The Bible talks about the, you know, the, the, lion, the lion that lies with the lamb, and then it talks about you know, the wolf that something was along the same lines in the book of Isaiah. They're used interchangeably. That's why people came up with that weird uh, Mandela effect, is because there are two passages that are very, very similar. So, these two things are very similar. How does a lion attack? What do they do? Have you ever watched a lion when it's stalking its prey? It's super elu elusive, isn't it? Like, stands back, real slow. It's creepy looking. And it's got, like, its eyes fixed on its prey. Has anyone ever saw wolves, like, seen a pack of wolves in front of them before? Have you ever looked at wolves before? Now, I, I don't know why, but I assume that wolves were much smaller animals, you know, than they actually are. But we went to um, Arizona, and it's a pretty cool place where you can drive around through these, through actually inside of their exhibits and where they're in, their, they're in captivity. I mean, they're fenced in. And they have, like, bears, and you just drive through them where the bears can, like, come up to your car, touch your car. They're like, nothing's preventing them from, like, smashing your window out. That's like, you're just driving through their exhibit. And there was a, an RV in front of us, and we entered into the captivity of the wolves. And I just pictured, and maybe this is only me, but I just pictured a wolf that looked about like a dog. Is that about what you pictured or no? Am I the only one that thought this? Maybe I'm the only one that thought this. But when we entered in there, that RV had down its extension strap that you plug into like a trailer that you're pulling, right? The adaptive strap. It was hanging down, so it drew all these wolves, and they were like playing with it, messing with it, right in front of my vehicle. So I really like pretty closely got to see how large these animals were. And I don't want to exaggerate this, but it looked like they stood about this tall. It looked like they were extremely big animals. It looked like very close to they were much more slender, but they looked like about the size of a lion. But they were much more slender than a lion. They stood very tall, and their heads were massive. I don't know why, but I pictured you know wolves as being you know these much more you know uh, more like a, not as small as a fox, but more along those lines. Maybe I'm only preaching myself right, myself right now, but wolves are large, ferocious animals. They are very dangerous, large, ferocious animals. That's why they are, they are likened unto lions. And the same way that a lion is elusive and attacks and stalks his prey, so does a wolf. That's why here it, 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 it goes even further and it says that, it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. What does that mean? Saying that they're going to come in and you're a sheep, and what are they going to do? They're going to act like a sheep. They're going to come in and they're going to be what? They're going to be elusive. What do you think a wolf would be doing while it's among sheep? The whole reason it's there is to devour its prey. It's going to be thinking and looking for opportunities. It's going to be devising a plan to hurt those around it. So notice how 
sneaky and how crafty they are. When false teachers or some sort of person that just wants to harm others in our church tries to come into our church, they're not going to come in and just openly spew their filth or just let you know if it's some, you know, some queer or something, lets you know that they're a homosexual. They're going to come in and they're going to try to act like you, like a sheep. They're going to come in and they're going to try to act like a Christian. You're a Christian, you know they're going to try to act like a Christian. They're going to act like they believe the same doctrine that you believe. They're going to act like they act the same way that you act. They're going to act like you guys are exactly the same. They're going to say, hey, I'm a sheep, you're a sheep. Because you know what you do then? Then you let your guard down. Hey, brother, how you doing? But it says this, but inwardly, they are ravening wolves. So when you look at them on the outside, they look like a brother. They look like a sister. They look like you. They act like you, right? But it says, but inwardly, inside, they're ravening. What does ravening mean again? It relates to being aggressive, and it relates to being hungry. What does it mean? It means that they want to devour you. They want to hurt you. They want to harm you. Real people like this exist. Real people like this exist. I want you to go with me now to 2 Peter chapter number 2. The majority of the time we're going to spend of the, the, the remaining portion of the sermon in two chapters. There are two major, very detailed chapters on false prophets in the New Testament that are parallel passages. But by comparing Scripture with Scripture, by reading one and then the other, we can learn a massive amount about this subject. But I wanted to start out the sermon by helping you understand how relevant this is and how this will happen. And there is no question, ultimately, a wolf will step into this church, this congregation. Whether we're in this same building or not, a wolf will come into our church. I guarantee you. I am 100% positive. You know why? Because Scripture says that it will 100% sure happen. So I can say it will 100% happen. A wolf will someday come in here and try to harm you and try to harm your family. They'll be looking for the vulnerable sheep. So the first three things that we saw, number one, it's like it unto a wolf is because it's a vicious animal, right? It's ravening, it's ferocious, it's aggressive, it's, it wants to devour and hurt things. They want to hurt people. Wolves feed on the weak, right? Not only that, they are elusive. They are elusive. Then we saw how they come in and they try to blend in. They're going to try to act like you. They're going to try to talk like you. They're going to try to act like a sheep or act like a Christian. Right? <clears throat> but inwardly, they are a ravening wolf. Luke chapter number 11, verse number 39 speaks of this as well. It says, And the Lord said unto them, that's Jesus, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter. It's like looking like a sheep, right? It says, now do you make, make clean the outside of the cup and the bladder. It says, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. So they come in and it looks like they're a good person. They look like a clean guy, right? They look like they live a righteous, godly life. They come in and they look like they're a good person. But inside, they're filthy. They're wicked. And they're ravening. They're desiring to devour someone. 2 Peter chapter number 2 we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. I want to read uh, two passages to you quickly before we go through this, and we're going to be walking through 2 Peter chapter number 2. I'm going to be highlighting identifiers of a false teacher. 2 Peter chapter, oh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter number 22, verse number 25 says this. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. Notice that. Then it says this. They have devoured the souls. So just like a roaring lion is ravening its prey. Remember, ravening means devouring. What is the prophet or the false prophet doing? It says they have devoured souls. They have taken the, tre the treasure and precious things. So notice it's like unto them taking money. So what are they interested in? These fleecing the flock, taking things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Why? Because they're killing people off. It's saying they're harming people and leaving the wife by herself. Ezekiel 22, 27, two verses later, it says this. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey. It says, to shed blood, notice again, and to destroy souls. So what does ravening mean? Excuse me. It means to devour. 
where it means to destroy. Those two words are used, or three words really are used interchangeably. Not only that, notice it's that her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes the false teacher that comes in, or I'm sorry, let me say this, the wolf that comes in is a false teacher. He's a person that's in a, a position of authority, and he climbs to this position of authority so that he can manipulate people. Because once you have power, then you're able to manipulate and hurt people. So they desire these positions of authority just to harm or to hurt people, right? So notice that it's the princes there. Notice before it said the false prophets. Notice it also said the Pharisees. So almost all the time it's people in a position of authority. And so it said this, and to destroy souls, and it says to get dishonest gain. So also, what are they interested in? Like the Bible says, filthy lucre. They're interested in money for themselves, right? So here, I want you to look with me in 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter number 2, the Bible says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily, that means secretly, that means it's not going to be open, right? They're going to try to do this behind the scenes. Who privily shall bring in damnable, damnable, heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So a couple of things that I want to point out here. Number one, like I said, privily. This person's going to come in and they're going to try to do this secretly. They're going to try to do this behind the scenes. And it says, what are they going to be doing? They're going to be bringing in damnable heresies. What is a damnable heresy? It's something that will send someone to hell. It's something that is going to corrupt or mess with what? The gospel, right? That is something that is considered a damnable heresy. It's something that will damn your soul to hell is what it's referring. Because what do they ultimately want to do? They want to devour souls. They want to hurt and to harm people. They want to cause harm. They're a grievous wolf, right? It says there, how are they going to do this? Even denying the Lord that bought them. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. This is not a person I've heard Pentecostals and those idiots try to say they're losing their salvation. God, Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world on the cross. He bought every single person, but you have to receive it. That's what it's saying. So it says, even denying the Lord that bought them. And it says, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Get Jude in your other hand, the book of Jude. So this is the parallel passage with that. <clears throat> I want, to, I want to compare something for you quickly. Obviously, you, everyone here is aware that yours truly has been accused of this exactly, right? Bringing in damnable heresies, privily. Well, it's, it's interesting because I want to show you a contrast right here. Because what does it say that this person does? It says they privily shall bring in damnable heresies, and then it explains it to you. What does it say? Even denying the Lord that bought them. Now, who's the Lord that bought them? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. So I'm going to show you how ironic. This is. Look over at the book of Jude, okay? Look at the book of Jude, verse number four. For there are certain men crept in unawares. These verses are parallel with one another. The whole passage is parallel, but these specific verses within this passage is parallel. Look at verse number four. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now watching this. Watch this. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the crowd that tries to say, hey, you privily brought in damnable heresy, they accuse me when I say that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one and only true God. They accuse me of fitting uh, 2 Peter chapter number 2's uh, definition here. But the problem is when you compare this to the book of Jude, and you look there at the very end of verse number 4, it says this, and denying the only Lord God. So how many Lord Gods are there? One. one. There's only one Lord God. Then it says this, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So if there's only one Lord, Je only one Lord God, and then right after that it says, and our Lord Jesus Christ, can our Lord Jesus Christ be a different Lord than our only Lord God? Maybe that's why Thomas... When, he, when Jesus Christ resurrected and showed himself to him, he said, My Lord and my God. Maybe Amen. that's why he said that. Because Amen. there is only one Lord God. Right. But I'm, I'm bringing in damnable heresy. When I'm teaching that the one and only true God is Jesus Christ in the flesh. You have lost 
your stinking mind. Right. If somebody is teaching that there is another God outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, you, my friend, are teaching damnable heresy. Right. You, whether you're saved or not, if you start repeating something like that, it's possible that you're damning people to hell. Just like these bunch of retards who know the right gospel, that it's by grace through faith, that it's not of works, but they want to go around repeating, repenting of your sins. How many people watch, and I think Ken Oven is saved, how many people watch Ken Oven's videos where he says the words, repeat of, repent of your sins so many different times. Yeah, you pin him down on it, and he explains and he articulates the right gospel. But repent of your sins is contrary to the correct gospel. Right. Do you know what he was doing when he said that? Repent of your sins? And it, 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 it uh, didn't allow people or disabled them from understanding the true gospel? He was damning people to hell. If you are standing up and you are teaching that Jesus Christ is this second person you know, of the Trinity and there's these three people, yeah, you may not believe that they are two different gods actually in your heart, just like Ken Oven didn't believe that you actually had to stop sinning. But what you are teaching, my friend, is damnable heresy. That's what it is. You're teaching the same thing with Stink and Jehovah's Witness. Right. They believe they're both different gods too, moron. You say God the Father and God the Son, but they're both the same God. You are an idiot. You're not even listening to what you're saying. God the Father, God the Son, they're not each other, but there's one God. And they're not two different gods, but it's God the Father and God the Son. And they're not each other, but there's one God. You're a stinking idiot. Right. You make right. People don't, it's like they don't, they, they don't actually listen to the words that they're saying. Yeah. You're just taught that there's two gods yeah. that are not each other. Now, if you want to use the word person, you know, that doesn't change it. That doesn't change anything. So, to try to accuse me, what, what you, you know how you would interpret Jude, the book of Jude, uh, chapter, obviously only one chapter, verse number four, they would say, deny the only Lord God, Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. You're a stinking heretic is right. what you are. You're That's teaching right. damnable heresy, my friend. Right. Try to act like, yeah, you privately brought in all this doctrine. But I'm exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Amen. exalting the one Lord God in Amen. the flesh. Amen. That is the only God, my friend. Right. Try to act like that's heresy. The fact that you would look at what I teach and, and interpret a verse like this, that proves that you're a stinking heretic, buddy. Right. I don't care whether you're saved or not. You're a heretic. Amen. Well, you can be saved and teach heresy. Right. That doesn't, you know, that's one of the works of the flesh. Study your Bible. Right. Instead of saying if somebody gets into heresy, that just proves they weren't saved to begin with. Well, I'm starting to question your salvation, moron. These people are they they they, they need to study their Bibles on their own independently. That's what people that's one thing that people struggle with. Hey, I'm not right about everything. You know, I'm gonna preach what I believe because I believe it. But if I preach something that's wrong and you believe it, there's personal responsibility that lies with you too, buddy. Right. You need to be a Berean and study your own Bibles instead of just repeating the, the junk that every, every single thing that a pastor stands up and teaches. Right. You need to have a brain, not be a stinking drone. Just listen to every single thing that I say and take everything that I say. Now, of course, I'm your pastor and I, I, I'm here to guide you and to teach you. If, and, you know, I, I, you know, I believe in the church that's in me. I believe that I'm apt to teach and that I'm not a novice. Amen. So I'm going to teach a lot of good doctrine to you. But let me say this. I will teach wrong things from this pulpit. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm always right. Obviously, you know that. I'm not always right. So that's why you need to think for yourselves. That's, and especially what, what happens if something happens to me, somebody else has to come in and fill this pulpit. Mm -hmm. You never know if there's... You know, down the road, if there's 85, 90 people, somebody else has to replace me, whatever happens. And you guys, and it's a guy maybe that joined the church five, six years went by, and you thought this guy was approved, that I ordained him, I'm just sick or something like that. And he ends up being a wolf. And you've been just, you know, believing everything that I say. Guess what you're going to do when he gets behind the pulpit? Believe everything that he says. And then he starts teaching heresy, starts teaching bad things. That's what happened in Arizona. They just got conditioned into believing everything. Right. To the point now where they go along with the teaching that the only more God. Compare it with John 17. You know, in John 17, he clearly references the one God. 
the one true God in heaven, right? And what does he say? What do they say? I'm sorry. What do they say? That that is referring to the Father. Well, be consistent, buddy. Then what's Jude talking about when he says the only Lord God? You'd have to be consistent and say, that's the same person Jesus was praying to. That's God the Father. You'd have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's teaching heresy, I think it's pretty plain that they're teaching heresy. That's right. right. Amen. So look at 2 Peter chapter number 2. There again it says, And bring upon themselves swift destruction. So notice it's something that's damnable. Why is it damnable? Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For, meaning because, if you believe not that I am he, saying the only Lord God. If you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. If someone preaches that the only Lord God is not the Lord Jesus Christ, that's damnable heresy. Right. So that's what the type of doctrine that people will bring in. Or they will teach something that is contrary to the grace of God. They will pervert the gospel like Galatians 1 says, right? What do they do always? What's the whole book of Galatians about? It's by grace and not of works. It's the whole theme of the book of Galatians. So these are the types of false prophets that will come in. And what they want to do is they want to devour souls. They want to damn your soul. So they're going to teach something that's going to cause the, the gospel to be corrupt enough that will send people to hell. So that is what it's talking about when it says swift destruction. Verse 2, it says this, And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Doesn't this look like this is something we need to be paying attention to and listen to? The word pernicious means destruction. It's actually being used interchangeably. If you look it up in a dictionary, that's what it means. A lot of this word is not used very often today. It, 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 I was actually looking up the etymology of the word er, uh, earlier because you only hear it every once in a while. And it's, it fell out of use in the late 19th century, the late 1800s. But it means destruction. It means damnable, basically. And if you look there at the end of verse 1... It says, bring upon themselves swift destruction, so they're being destroyed. And then it says, and many shall follow their pernicious way. What? Of what? Destruction. So they're actually even being used interchangeable. The, the Bible can always be your dictionary. So it's saying that people will follow them. So we should take heed to this, and we should make sure that we do not follow this type of junk, this type of garbage, false teachings. It says, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. All, you know... Something that's common in independent fundamental Baptist churches is perversion. It's, you know, pastors, you know, you know uh, pastors being pedophiles, pastors sleeping with congregants, pastors doing all types of wickedness, you know, assistant pastors, youth pastors, deacons, doing all types of disgusting things in their congregation, or just maybe stealing money, putting their hand in the plate of God, in the bag of God. These things are common. And you know when you talk to somebody, and maybe at your job, and I've experienced this many times, you try to preach to them the gospel, they always want to try to throw that in your face. And you know what I always tell them? I always say, hey, well, that just actually proves the Bible, because this was prophesied of. The Bible says, speaking about those people, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That actually proves the prophecy in the Bible. That's why I always tell people when they bring that up to me, every time. The Bible teaches... And, I, and I'll try to reason with them even further than that. Doesn't, wouldn't it make sense if the church is pure and holy and the Bible, the Bible teaches that there's God and there's the devil and there's a fight between good and evil that wicked people would try to infiltrate the church? It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So this, this, this proves the Bible when we see these types of things happen. And, you know, there's been a recent t scandal with this guy Cameron Giovanelli. Does anybody know who he is and heard of him? He was a pastor up in Maryland at Calvary Baptist Church and the new pastor called this guy out Publicly, the guy actually lived in Jacksonville, Florida, Orange Park. So he was he was he was pastoring a church, Calvary Baptist Church, like ten years or so ago in in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And he, during a time while there was this woman, Sarah Jackson, who was in his church, he was actually committing, you know, uh, 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 I believe fornication. He was committing adultery himself. I don't know if they went into specifics, but he was some sort of, you know. Extremely immoral, inappropriate behavior with a 16, 17, 18 year old girl for a few years. This went on. Well, she never said anything for many years. When she did, she went to the new pastor of that church. His name is Stately Shiflet. This stuff is on the computer. You can look it up, it's on the web. And he contacted Cameron Giovanelli, which was then on staff. This was just last year, last summer. He was then on staff at 
um, uh, Golden Baptist Church. It's Jack Trevor's church and seminary out in California. He contacted them and told them about this information. He said, hey, I have all the documentation. I've been meeting with my deacons. I've shook all my deacons. I've spoken to other people that are on staff. I have text messages. I have damning information on this guy, and I want to show it to you so that you can handle this the way you see fit. He, he said, I don't want to go public with this, and they just tried to brush it under the rug. And this guy actually, and he put it out there publicly, so he's obviously, and he wrote a book about it as well. The reason why this made this guy so mad that they tried to brush this under the rug was because things like this actually happened to him two times in his life. He was growing up, he had, when he was like uh, 16 or 15, he was going to an independent fundamental Baptist church, and they had a preacher boy that had just got out of college and was traveling to an associated church who stopped and stayed all night at his church. And because they were association, they reached out to his church, hey, can this guy stay there? They let this preacher boy go in there, just graduated college, who was going to be an assistant pastor, and this guy tried to molest him in the middle of the night. So he woke up, they told that church about it, guess what they did? He still went there and still was the assistant pastor. Then, at 22 years old, after he graduated Bible college, he went and, and was uh, uh, going to be a part of a church, and he started, uh, um, he was offered a position as a youth pastor of like a 400, 500 uh, a member church. And he was he said he was just amazed. He was in awe. He was extremely excited. He was ready to get in the ministry at a young age. Well, and he, and he couldn't believe that they had chosen him. The head pastor picked him. Well, a few weeks go by, a couple of months go by, I'm not sure the exact time period, they went to a hotel because they were going out of town for ministry work, and the head pastor comes and knocks on his door, some old gray-headed man, and comes in there and, and with a proposition for something immoral. So, this is some guy that's like 50, 60 years old who's your head pastor. Can you imagine something so horrible and disgusting taking place? It's, it's just appalling to even think about. These things happen. These type of people exist. He debated on how he was going to deal with this situation for the next two to three weeks. Because he thought, hey, they're not going to believe me. He ended up confronting that pastor... And telling him, hey, you need to take this to the board of elders or the board of deacons. And we need to resolve this and you need to admit to this. Well, thankfully the guy did. He did. And he resigned. They got rid of him and everything. They sent that pastor. That church sent that pastor to go be an administrator at a Christian school in another state. Stacy Shiflett and his father left and drove to that school, spoke to that head pastor, told them, hey, all these elders and all these deacon and assistant pastors of this church will come down here. And they said they would testify on my behalf and tell you he admitted to it. They left, and that guy continued being the pastor there. And Stacy Shiflett, when he made all this public, he just said, hey, I have a personal experience with this, and it damaged me. Most people would get out of the ministry when some 60-year-old man comes knocking on your door that you looked up to, that you honored, that you thought, hey, this is my spiritual leader in the Lord, and he turns out to be some stinking reprobate, pedophile child of God or the devil. Far from being a child of God. Child of Satan knocking on your door. Right. That would discourage someone so badly. You know, most people would just put, would just go home. So he said, hey, I'm not putting up with this. We are not brushing this under the rug. And independent, and this is a fact, independent fundamental Baptists have made it a practice to try to hide this crap because they're so scared that it'll make them look bad. Well, we're going to do the exact opposite. If anything like that happens, I will make sure that that whole thing goes public. Amen. I will make sure that the whole stinking city knows about it. I'll make sure that everybody knows about it. This freak tried to come into our church and tried to hurt somebody. Right. We'll do the exact opposite. Man. I'm going to take the rug and I'm going to throw the stinking rug away is what I'm going to do. I'm going to expose these types of freaks for what they are. Man. You know, and those types of things should anger you, but another thing it should do is it should cause what I was saying a few minutes ago to have a little bit more flesh on it and become a little bit more alive. This type of stuff happens all the time. And these type of people exist and they come in to hurt the young. Who do they go after? The new guy, the youth pastor, just got in the ministry. He's young. He ended up finding out, like 10 people stepped forward that he had done that to that kept their mouth shut. 10 other people. 
Now, obviously, they should have been brave enough to come forward. You know, obviously, there's there's definitely a major degree of a, of sympathy that goes forward to them, but they also have a responsibility to warn the other people and not to allow. That's wicked too. Right. Allow other people to get hurt in the church. I understand you're hurt, but that doesn't give you the right. That's just like a woman being raped. Why well, I'm just going to go kill my baby? It's the same kind. Two wrongs. Don't make a right, my friend. If you're hurt, you need to still go step forward and have some guts and warn the rest of the people in the church and tell everybody what happened. Yeah. You know, so if anything like this ever happens, this point to that, you make sure that you come tell me. Amen. I don't care who it is. I don't care if you think it's your best stinking friend. It doesn't matter. This crap has to be dealt with. Amen. These types of things have to be opened up and everybody has to know about them. And, and to be honest... You know, you know, like what Stacy Shiflett did, we will make. I will do. I would do everything in my power that that guy lost his job. I'm not gonna say anything about him. He he was 22. He was doing whatever he whatever he could. I'm not gonna waste my life either. But I would stink and knock their door down. If somebody tried to, if he tried to leave and go to another church or something like that happened, I would call that church. I would I would say I would make that public. I put it all over social media. We need to expose people like this. Amen. You're not giving them a chance to get out there and hurt other people and hurt other kids. Some filthy, stinking, old pervert going to try to molest some young, pure man who's saved and wants to get in the ministry. Right. Who, maybe, who maybe would go out there and get thousands and thousands of people saved. I don't know Stacey Shiflett's uh, uh, particular testimony, but he might be an amazing soul winner. He might be an amazing pastor right. that may not have been in the ministry because of this old, disgusting freak. Yeah. So this kind of stuff... Needs to have the lid popped open on it. Everybody needs to see it. Amen. This is not something that needs to be private. Like I said, same point. Not private in your life either. Anything like this happened. If anyone ever tries to proposition you, you tell me immediately. Amen. I don't care who it is. I'll kick you out of the church. Which I don't, you know, don't, don't take that as I'm suspecting you. I would kick anybody out of this stinking church. That should make everybody here feel good. If you're thinking, hey, I'm definitely not you know, guilty. But if it is even somebody who has been here all along, I would throw you out of this stinking church so quick and I don't care who you are. Good. I'm not kidding. I care about the people in this church and I will not let that happen. Amen. So, notice it says that by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. These people bring a bad name to the to independent fundamental Baptist churches, Bible-believing churches. But you know how much better it would be for us if something like that happened? And I stood up and everybody knew, I'm not putting up with this freak. Get out of the church. That's what we need to do. That's, what, that's, that's the best stance that we need to take in these types of situations. Either way, the world's going to try to say, hey, look at what this, this pervert who, who did that. But it's that much worse if we try to hide it. Yeah. You always need to bring these things public. Verse number three, notice, and through covetousness shall they, with feigned words, they're faking. They, they are a wolf in sheep's clothing, and they desire, they lust after things. Covetousness. That's sometimes covetousness. Talk about coveting, uh, uh, in the Bible talks about coveting your neighbor's wife. I want you to notice here in a minute that these people are perverts. So these people can be a pervert as well. Oftentimes they are a pervert, let me say that. Almost, almost all the time they are perverts. Right here specifically, it says this, Shall they with faint words make merchandise of you? So you can take that both ways, whether it's lusting after a person or their goods. It says, Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not, saying they're going to be punished soon. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And then he goes forward to, it's interesting because he mentions perverts here. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. What's he talking about? Like that old, dirty pervert that came and knocked on that guy's door. That's what, in the context of false prophets, it mentions a sodomite. Notice the consistency there. This happens very often. Look at verse 7. And deliver just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, this goes to show the things you see and hear hurt you. Seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. He might not have been doing it, but he saw and heard those things, and it's vexing him and hurting his, 
hurt his soul. Verse 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Notice the emphasis on being a sexual pervert and despise government. They don't like being ruled over. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Verse 11, whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. You compare scripture to scripture, this is actually talking about bringing a railing accusation before the devil. It says that in the book of Jude, uh, where we're going to go over there in just a moment. So it's talking about them hating dignities and things, and things like that. It's not talking about somebody who says despise government. People are very simple-minded with these words sometimes. It's not just talking about specifically our federal government. It's talking about any type of ruler. And in this sense, it's talking about a spiritual ruler. Because in context, it's talking about how they will say bad things about the devil when even the angels wouldn't say that. They'll say things about higher powers when even the angels wouldn't do that. So it's talking about spiritual powers in context. Look at verse uh, 12. But these... As, watch this, natural brute beasts. So in their nature, they are as natural brute beasts. This takes us back to Romans chapter number 1, where it's, it talks about how they do things that are against nature, right? And then it says that they are as natural, and it says brute beasts. What does brute mean? Brute means stupid or foolish. That word is used in Romans chapter number 1. Says that they are a beast, right? If you look in the book of Leviticus, when you see the command and the law given that homosexuals are to be put to death, or sodomites are to be put to death, you know what you see real close to that? If a woman lies with an animal, it says also, a beast, they are to be put to death. Because it's sexual per perversion. It says this, made to be taken and destroyed. This is what God thinks of these types of people. Speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes. Notice this. Sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast among you. What's the emphasis on right there? Saying that they're committing all this wickedness, this deceit, and they're just lying while they're doing what? They're like a brother sitting down next to you and eating with you. They're like a sister that comes in and sits down next to you and eats with you, right? We don't want to step out of here and while we're eating, we're like, oh. you know, charity believes all things, right? Start questioning everybody whether they're a wolf. These are red flags, obviously. And we use these as indicators to try to see what type of person a false teacher or a false prophet is. So it says that they're that they're there among you and they're they're sporting themselves, right? It says with their own deceivings while they feast. With you, saying they're among you and they're lying. Then look at verse number 14. Having eyes full of adultery. So the person that has their eyes just full of adultery, it's what they, they're just filled with just looking and lusting after other women or words. Obviously, in this case, it is a man, so it would be other women, right? Because, because teachers and preachers are what? They're men. So their, their eyes are just full of adultery. It says, watch this, and they and that cannot cease from sin. This is super important. Beguiling unstable souls. What do you keep seeing coming up over and over again? What do they do? They prey on the 22-year-old guy that just got the ministry. They prey on the weak. They try to go after the weak. This is why you need to make sure you're not the weak. You're not the babe Christian. You need to be a strong Christian. So if anything like this ever happens, you are strong enough to stand up to it. You are strong enough to bring it to light if something like this ever happens. Amen. It says, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices. Cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of right, unrighteousness. So notice over and over again, covetous is spoken of, money, receiving things, making merchandise of people, adultery, perversion, going after the weak. Notice how there's a lot of just, just consistency here repeated, and it lines up with how a wolf is. Look at verse number, uh, let's skip down, verse 17. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, the words of vanity, they're meaningless. They allure through the flesh. What does that mean, allure? 
They're coercing you. Alluring is like what you would do when you're manipulating an animal. Like a lure, right? Like for a fish. You're manipulating this animal. It's to draw them in. Just like it says, even it says, false, even among yourselves shall false teachers arise, Paul said. What does it say? Drawing men after them. Right? Making disciples. That means to allure, to bring people after them. Then it says this, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. I want to go over the book of Jude now. We're going to go through quickly the, the parallel passage with this. I don't want to be too long, but it's going to be a lot of the same points. <clears throat> Notice here in verse number 3, it says this to begin with. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. So what did he want to write about? I gave all diligence saying this was what I was real serious that I wanted to write about. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but I'll point it out. He was diligent. It means you're, you're, you're working real hard and you're very earnest about this. You're very serious, right? To be diligent. He says, when I gave all diligence to write unto you about the common salvation, he wanted to talk about the fact, hey, we're delivered. We're brethren. You're saved and I'm saved. Isn't that something to rejoice about and talk about that? He said, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. He says this, though. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. So he says, I wanted to write unto you about the common salvation, but there was something that was needful. And then he says that... What's needful is that I need to write unto you to contend for the faith. Now, this is actually what's needful. Hey, I love talking about how I'm saved. Praise God. You know, I am thankful for my salvation. You know, I love singing the hymns because it just makes me grateful for my salvation. When it talks about how easy salvation is, how he paid it all, you know, we're brothers and we're all delivered. We get to come here in unity. That we're all trusting in the blood of Christ to save us. That's right. important. But you know what? Sometimes there's things that are necessary that need to be preached. Right. Sometimes there's other things. And Jude said, hey, I wanted to write to you about the common salvation, but there's something that's necessary that I need to write to you about. I need to warn you about something. I, you need to contend. What does contend mean? Fight. Contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men. And I say because. For there are certain men crept in unawares. Privily. Secretly, They crept in like a wolf, like a lion, elusive. Who were before of old ordained for this condemnation. Now people try to use that in a Calvinist way. No, it's saying that people that would do this were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Saying that hell was created a while ago for people like this. It says, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. What's lasciviousness? It's saying they're using the gospel, if you will... For their own sexual perversion, for filth and disgusting things, right? That's what lasciviousness refers to. It refers to something sensual that's that's not appropriate. Um, and then it says this, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You know who they're denying when they deny the only Lord God? I'm going to repeat it. The Lord Jesus Christ. Right. I will therefore put you in remembrance, because it's necessary, he's saying. Because people do creep in. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. He's saying even though those people are among you, just like those wicked people were among the Israelites, once you get to this, to the, to you know, let's say the end times, right? God is going to save and deliver the Christians, and then those other people that were among the Israelites, they were destroyed. Right? They were killed. That's what he's saying. Those that are among you, that were like they were among the Israelites, they were destroyed. Even though they were mixed in and mingled with them. Just talk about how certain men crept in. They're with them. It says this. Notice it's not those that, you know, lived a good life that were saved. It says this. Notice again, verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. Verse 6, and the angels which kept not their first to Satan, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under darkness under the day, unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. That's why we call Sodomites queer, because they go after strange flesh. They're queer. Are set forth an example. That means an example for today. Sodom and Gomorrah is an example to Sodomites of today. Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also, look at this. These filthy dreamers defile the flesh. I have to point this out. 
tower bring it up repeatedly. But the whole issue with I'm gonna I'm gonna cross reference Second Peter chapter number two verse number one. You know, people that are still trying to hang on to this prophets prophesying, and now prophets means teachers. They try to use Second Peter chapter number two verse number one where it says, "But there were false prophets also among the people," and then he says, "Even as there shall be false teachers among you." So that proves that there's a transition from false prophets to false teachers. Therefore, we take everything that's written to false prophet or to prophets and we apply it to teachers. That is ridiculous. That is so, so ridiculous. There were pastors and teachers in the church in 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 was not written to them. It was written to prophets. So they were even there present at that time, and they knew this was not addressed to them. Now, furthermore, I'm going to show you the stupidity of trying to apply this in this such of a way. It, the, the claim is that, hey, prophets don't exist anymore because teachers have replaced them. Well, this passage is about false prophets. And there's no time period on when a false prophet can exist because they're a false prophet. <laughs> Just like someone could stand up and falsely prophesy... 3,000 years ago, someone could stand up and falsely prophesy today, you idiot. Right. Do you realize the stupidity here? But what's going on here is a false prophet is a false teacher. Right. But not every false teacher is a false prophet. Right. So yes, he's referring to them as false teachers because a false prophet is a false teacher. And I'm going to further prove that to you because what was one of the, what is the other name for a prophet? Seer. 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 Why? Because they see what? Vision. And dream. Okay. Look at Jude, the person he's speaking of. Verse 8, likewise also these present-day filthy dreamers. This is a parallel passage. The false prophet, false teacher today, he's a filthy dreamer. It means he's a false prophet. False prophets are said to exist in the end times as well. So that's, that is a retarded argument. That's majorly trying to stretch. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, now it applies to teachers, you know, teachers, because prophets are out of the scene, so we have to take this and apply this to teachers. And my supporting verse is 2 Peter chapter number 2, because it says, even if there was false prophets among us, there shall be false teachers among you. See the transition there? Eh? That's ridiculous. That is disparity where someone is just trying to keep alive something that they, that's, that's, that's pride, where they're trying to keep something alive. After you debunk something, then they go and try to find something like that. It's ridiculous. These people are false prophets. They're called a false teacher because a false prophet is a false teacher as well. And it's not a false teacher in the end times that's not a false prophet because in Jude, he's specifically referred to as a filthy dreamer, which is a seer, a false prophet. So look there further, it says this, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak yeah. evil, evil of dignities. Notice that one of the signs you can look out for is that this is a person that doesn't like to be ruled over. They are a person that does not like authority, right? So that's something you can look out for. Also it said in 2 Peter chapter 2 that they are self-willed. This is a person that is self-willed. Verse 9, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Notice this. Durst not, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. So notice in context, the despising of government is a spiritual government. Verse 10, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they have corrupted themselves. Woe unto them, that means a curse, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam. Notice they, they desire, they're covetous, they desire filthy lucre. After the error of Balaam for reward and perish in the gainsaying of Cory, they're desiring the authority. Of course, they, they hate authority because they want to be the authority. Verse 12, these are spots in your feasts of charity. So you have charity among you, but these, these people, they're not charitable. Your feast is a charity of feasts, or is a feast of charity, right? But they sneak in, and these people are spots among you. Spots are oftentimes blemishes, sin is what it's referring to. So these are, these are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Notice this person has a sheared conscience, seared conscience. It says they're without fear. They're as cool as a cucumber. While they're planning to, to hurt you and to hurt your family without fear. 
It says this, also with that in mind, it says, without fear, it says, clouds, they are without water. Notice the reference to this person just like, it makes me think like, that. along the lines, we'll say like, man, that person just doesn't have a soul. Mm -hmm. Right? It says, clouds, they are without water. They're just, their conscience is seared. Like when you're saying someone doesn't have a soul, you're saying like, you are just hardened to the core. Right? This would be like a person that is a psychopath. That is a certified, you know, medical, medically diagnosed psychopath. Like Jeffrey Dahmer would go rape some, you know, man, kill him, throw him in the back of his car, drive home, get pulled over by a cop, and the cop's like, I don't have a clue he had a body in there. Why? Without fear. Conscience is totally serious. Goes home while this person that he had just, you know, defiled and killed is laying in the trunk of his car and go inside and eat because he's hungry. That's what, there are people like that in this world. Without fear, it says clouds they are without water. They don't have a soul. I'll prove that to you further that is what it's referring to. Clouds they are without water, carried about with the wind. Watch this, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit. And then it's going further, it's, it's building this. Then it says this, twice dead. What is twice dead? Saying they're physically dead or spiritually dead. These people are reprobates. Right. They're gone. They don't have the opportunity of salvation. We're not right. going to convert these types of people. They're twi they're already dead. They're right. twice dead. You know, yeah. like you're passed from death unto life. They're already passed from life unto death. They're twice dead. It's as if they had already been damned the second time. That's what that means. Just like you're already saved, they're already damned. Yeah. It says... And then it says this, plucked up by the roots. You say, I want to get them saved. There's no roots left. They're taken and ripped out. They're not there anymore. They don't have a soul. Right. Their conscience is seared. These type of people are reprobates. It means Man. rejected. They have no, they have no uh, um, hope of salvation. 13, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shade. Wandering stars. And then it says this. Well, maybe we can get them saved. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. I have, like the Bible talks about, I go, and Jesus said, I go to a prepared place for you, right? If I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Well, right before that, he says, in my Father's house are many mansions. And then he goes on and, and, and makes those two statements that I just said. So I have a mansion and a place that's reserved for me in heaven because I'm eternally secure. But this person has a place reserved in hell. Like, that's their spot. That, that, that means... These people are damned already. People don't like to believe this, but the Bible teaches that there are people that can't be saved anymore. Right. I have a place reserved in heaven. They already have a place reserved in hell. You contrast those two things. You know, then you'd have to you'd be inconsistent with your eternal security here. So we have eternal security. We have eternal damnation. While on this earth, that fate can already be sealed, one or the other. Right. So. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Let's hurry up and get through the rest of this. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, the, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly. Watch this. Among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches with ungodly sinners have spoken against them. I think Jude felt pretty strongly about these people, right? Then it seemed redundant. Like, man, that's, that's pretty redundant. Well, Maybe, you remember when I, when, I, when I preached a sermon about how, why the dream was repeated? Because it was grievous. It's very important and significant. Why do you think he's telling you ungodly, ungodly, ungodly? Maybe it's because they're extremely, extremely ungodly. They're filthy dreamers. This is hard language all throughout this passage. They're filthy, they're ungodly, they're perverse, they're twice dead, they're plucked up by the roots, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever, Sodom and Gomorrah. These are wicked, wicked, evil people. These types of people want to come in the church. Think about that. Go find the most disgusting, horrible, wicked person. He, he has no hope of salvation, but he's going to come in here and he's going to act like you. He's going to try to buddy up with you. He wants to sit down. He wants to eat. He's going to eat with you. He knows the things that he's thinking. He'll think about them while he's right there next to you. Filthy, disgusting thoughts of what he wants to do to you, what he wants to do to this church, what he wants to do to the people in the church, to your children. And you know he does it without fear. He just, why? It's a cloud without water. It's conscience. The Bible talks about conscience being seared. Right? It's like... Jeffrey Dahmer. 
these these just you know people that just don't have a soul. Just wicked, wicked, evil people. That's the type of person he's saying. These ungodly people when it comes to the church and her people. We need to watch out for these people. Look at verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers. Notice that. These are, these are identifiers of these types of people. They're going to be a murmur. They're going to be a complainer. Walking after their own lusts. Notice a moment ago, too, he, 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 uh, he talked about how he destroyed the wicked people that believe not amongst Israel. Right? Now, not all of them, I'm sure, were reprobate. But I'm sure that there, what there was was there was a really super wicked group within there, like Corey, right? And what did he do? He stirred up the rest of the people, and he got all those other ungodly people to follow his pernicious ways. He was a type of a false prophet, right? And what did everyone do? They were murmuring, they were complaining, right? Notice how all these things are all tied together. You can draw lines. What was mentioned? The... Israelites being killed after they left Egypt. Corey, you see all of these uh, parallels. Then it says this, and their mouth speaking great swelling words. This person is going to be eloquent. They're going to speak great swelling words. Then this is very important. These are signs you need to keep in your mind. Having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. You know what that means? Having men's persons in admiration. Your person of who you are, having that in admiration saying that they're admiring your person. Great swelling words, right? What are they doing? They're flattering you. That's what that means. Having your person in admiration saying that they are admiring. That's what that means. Why? For advantage. Why? Because they want to get an advantage over you. Because you know what they do when someone flatters you? You, this is just human nature. You're like, that's ah, a good guy. Ah. Why? Because he likes you. People do this, and you do this, whether you want to admit it or not. When people come in and they say good things about you, it makes you put your guard down. You're like, that's a good person. Human nature is, hey, if people like me, then I like them. Oftentimes, that's how people are just naturally. Just, just in your nature, that's how you are. That's a good guy, right? Because they're like, hey, looking good today, Brother Russell. Huh? Looking good. And then you put your guard down, obviously it's going to be a little bit more you know, elusive than that. But they come in and they try to admire you all the time. The Bible has a lot of bad things to say about flattery. It needs to at least be something true, though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but they, the Bible has a lot of bad things to say about flattery. And they're bad people because that's why people flatter you. And that's what happens when someone starts flattering you. They're trying to get you to like them. And then when you like them, then you put your guard down. You know what they have over you? Having men's purses and ad persons in admiration. Why? For advantage. The whole reason they're doing that is so you put your guard down. And then they have an advantage over you. Yeah, why don't you come over for dinner next week? Why don't you come over for dinner? Now, I'm not trying to make you like super paranoid. I'm just giving you how people plan things. They come over to your house, your kid's playing in his room, and they're like, hey, i got to go to the bathroom. This is just a, t a possible scenario. You know? That's why you watch your kids close around everybody. Amen. Don't just suspect people, but keep an eye on your children. Right. Keep an eye on your kids, right? We need to make sure we, we, we take care of our children. We're entrusted by God with them. You know, we need to raise them right, and we need to look out for their safety. So they, they try to get an advantage over you, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll admire you and say, hey, good things about you, right? So it says this. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to know who that only Lord God is? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. Then he gives this last admonition. I'm going to read this real quick. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. He says this, keep yourselves. Keep yourself. What do you mean to keep yourself? Refer to the word like like maintaining or retaining something, right? Preserve. We're kept. I believe it's in Jude. It says that we are preserved in Jesus Christ. In verse number one, 
talks about us elsewhere being kept in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It's talking about preserving something. It's talking about keeping yourself safe. Watching out. Excuse me. Watching out. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Real people out there exist like this. Real false prophets, and they shall. Notice it said, grievous wolves shall enter in among you. I forgot to point this out, but you don't need to turn there. Uh, 2 Peter chapter number 2 says this, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Notice both times are imperative statements. But it's, not, it's, it's undoubtable. It's without a doubt. There will be false teachers among us. It will happen, without a doubt. 100%. Wolves will try to come in here. So what, what should we do? We need to watch. You need to know your Bible. You need to know what a false prophet is like. These passages are, are in here for you to know what a false prophet or a false teacher is like. That's why they're in here. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. What's a wolf like? It's like a lion. What did it talk about a wolf doing? Devouring. What does it do? It walks about and it seeks. Walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What's he doing? They're plotting, and they're planning, and they're looking for opportunities to do this. So, if they're preparing themselves, you need to prepare yourself. Be strong. And, 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 and don't be naive. Too many Christians are naive. And, and you know what happens? Horrible things, tragic things that alter the whole course of their life that they can never get over happen to them. Whether it be adultery, whether it be pedophilia, whatever it may be. Just, just, just terrible, horrible things happen. Look for the red flags. Look for the horrible. Look for you know, the, 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 all of the different descriptions that are given of the, the wicked, evil, false prophets. But we're given tons of them for a reason. This, those chapters go into great detail. And Paul, his last warning, he could tell this is serious. And he says, watch these, therefore. And he says, and remember that for the space of three years, I cease not with tears to warn you. Of what? He's talking about the grievous wolves that are going to enter in. He's reminding them again of things that he ceased not for three years to warn them about. It's super important. It's extremely important. We need, our church is in early, is, is, is young. We're still a baby church right now. You know, what's, it's going to be, a, it's a lot easier right now. You know, if one person comes in, two people come in, but when our church gets larger and people are being added to the church weekly, monthly, it's going to become a lot more difficult. People just kind of sneak in. The larger the church is, it's a lot easier. Right? The larger the flock of sheep, it's easier for that wolf to kind of come sneak in there, isn't it? When there's, you know, just a couple, well, then it's more noticeable. We need to keep our eyes open. We need to watch. And it's good that we have this warning now. Let's bow our eyes and have a word for us. So Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the warning. We thank you for the Apostle Paul's words and recording those for us. We thank you for the great description and details that we are given of the wolf, dear Lord, and of the, the grievous wolves that are going to come in, the false prophets, and how they act, and allowing us to just get in their minds and how they operate, and just also letting us know how wicked they are and the, and the, the vast uh, uh, grief that they can cause in a church. So that, that would cause us to be even more so on our watch, dear Lord. We ask you to be here, be with us, and help us here uh, uh, to be vigilant, and help me as a pastor to watch after the flock, and to do a good job of being the overseer. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.